GM. Wow, what a trailer. That is absolutely phenomenal. Um, we'll watch that again in a minute. I'll just have a little quiz for you as well um, before we get cracking. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to say hello. And um, it's good to see you again. Or, or well, I, I don't really see you, but you see I, my ugly mug. And um, I've been away for a lot, a uh, long time, playing chess uh, last four weeks or so. So I'm really sorry about the lack of videos. But I need to play now and again. I've been playing some serious competitions. And in this video, I'm going to share with you... Well, I'm going to share my games with you over the next week or two. I'll throw in some blitz as well at some point. But we're going to have a look at a very interesting game today in a second. But first of all, well, I've got to say thank you to the person who made that clip. And uh, Chess Psychedelia, um, who, who is on Twitter, if you search for him uh is just an amazing artist and he did this youtube clip specifically for me and you know i just think it's one of the best things anyone's ever made for me him and aldo artist a brilliant artist and you know i can't thank them more and other people who've done stuff as well i got such a long list of people who helped me out here but watch the trailer again and try to now see how many things related to me and ginger gm are in that trailer and I'll give you a clue. There is a duck in there. That's one clue. See, see how many more you can spot. I mean, I've watched this trailer now about 30 times. And also, should I say the music's also done by Chess Psychedelia as well. I love the music. Dark and dark and grimy. Love it. And just watch it one more time and see how many chess, chess sort of uh, ginger GM things you can spot there. So come on. Are you ready? Let's do it one more time. Okay. <laughs> GM. Wow, I mean, it's just simply fantastic. Um, so I must, uh, I must thank uh, again Chess Psychedelia uh, for that amazing clip. And if you want to know more about that, I'm sure Chess Psychedelia will will answer in the in the comments below. But we're hoping he'll do a bit more work for us. Okay, well, first of all, um, I'll give a, a clip. I'll give a little timeline below this because I'm going to do a little bit of wabbling just to catch up because you're my friends out there and you know it's like I've been away from you I've missed you all I've missed you all. I shed a tear so I want to just do a little bit of catching up but we will look at some chess as well soon so if you if you want to avoid me talking and catching up and telling you about a little bit about the last three weeks then just jump to the timeline below and you should get an educational free lesson um so what the hell has been going on well first of all I played uh, an all-play-all, a nine-round all-play-all, and it was the Dundee, which is a, a place in Scotland, 150th year anniversary. And it was a strong event. There was um, two international masters playing. It was an all-play-all, so everyone plays each other, and eight grandmasters playing. And the first time I played in Dundee was actually in 1993, and it's the first time I ever played in the British championship proper the the top event and i played conor minad there who's one of the players now uh, i had an okay event i mean i came second on tie break uh, in actual fact i think i should have done a lot better um i was think, think i was playing pretty well there and i missed a lot of chances uh, in my eyes and what i'm going to do i'm going to go through each of my rounds there and tell you a little bit how i prepared for the game what i was thinking and of course about the game itself, where where I play well and where where I play badly. Um, so again, you're going to jump into the mind of a grandmaster here, see my thoughts. I'm going to use a computer this time above, just so you can follow the top line, the line that's played. Now, I don't particularly like that always, but it, it is sometimes a, a useful tool if used in the right way. Now, you're going to see I'm not going to rely on the computer's assessment there, but I will use it occasionally. And I'm doing this on chess.com, who have this now analysis board feature, which is pretty good because they use Stockfish uh, 8, and it's an incredibly strong program. So it is very good. Um, so let's first of all have a look at the, the cross tables over on Dundee, the final cross tables. And this is after the tournament had finished. So um, Andrew Greet 
It was only an international master from Scotland won it. And as we'll see later on, I lost a key game against him. I was very disappointed about that game. Uh, I came second on tiebreak on five and a half out of uh, nine games. And you can see, you know, I, I think everyone's a bit underrated in this tournament. There's a lot of grandmaster there who have a low elo. But uh, I think they're a lot higher than that. I mean, for example, Rosenthalis has been 2670 before, etc., etc. Um, and you can see a picture here of my of my first round opponent, who was Kitty Van Arakmir Grant. He's a very strong player. She's only rated 2364, but again, very underrated. She was women's world champion in 1985, and she was women's Soviet champion in 1990. And in order to have those two two roles, you know, to, in order to win those two titles, you need to be extremely good player and she certainly is and we'll look at the game shortly now another thing i do want to mention um i haven't had a chance to address this yet on youtube so i'm going to do it now i'm going to try to uh, make sure my language is not too bloody awful is um uh, me versus ben feingold now um i'm playing a grudge match against him at the start of october october 4th or 5th and I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute, but maybe you want to hear my views on that. Well, I mean, first of all, I've never met Ben in my life. I know he has a certain sense of humour. I didn't realise at first. He has a sense of humour where he basically takes the piss out of everyone. He's nasty to everyone. Well, not necessarily true. He takes the piss out himself as well, but he does do these things. And I understand it's OK to be like rude to people and stuff, uh, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have to say I heard that he was being very rude to me and to English players in general and maybe I took it the wrong way maybe I should have just took it more as a joke but you know I don't mind people who I've never met before or uh, generally or people I've never heard of uh, I expect to get quite a lot of abuse on YouTube and other places it's normal and I really don't mind it at all it's quite funny most of the time but when it's a fellow professional who uh, also tries to make a living doing the same thing suddenly throwing accusations about i find that i find that a bit strange you know i mean i think he said uh, i'm only a 1900 strength gm not really a gm uh stuff like this and uh, some other stuff and you know, i watched a clip of this and i thought well basically i thought i'm not i'm going to keep this video pg so i'm not going to tell you what i thought but it wasn't particularly nice and I, I responded and there's nothing about this match that was set up I responded to him and I said, well, what the what the flipping heck are you trying to do? Come on, how dare you? And it, it, it sort of then went backwards and forwards. I calmed down a bit after that and realised that it was only Ben being Ben, for better or worse. And um, I thought, OK, well, fair enough, you know, and we've turned this into positive now. And we're going to have this grudge match, which which certainly is a bit of a grudge match where we're going to play each other over the course of three hours. Now, I don't know how I'm going to do because I think bullet chess is thrown in there. You know how bad I am at that. But I'm certainly hoping to spank his bloody bottom and teach him who bloody. I'm just going to say bloody for now. I will be swearing at other view, videos, but I'm going to keep it calm for this one. Uh, show him who the bloody patcher is anyway. So uh, we'll go to that. So anyway, if you haven't heard about it, I'll just I'll just show you now a, a web page that chess.com ha have put up uh, about this and they're the one who've agreed to sponsor the match so here you go and I'm sure you can search you know search the title there and you can find this article on chess.com and basically you know, read, read a little bit more and you can see that it, it basically the match is going to be oh for, this is so brilliant for the first time ever there's going to be parent parental warnings ever in a chess event so we're both allowed to swear and whatever you know and i'm certainly going to be giving it some verbals in that one and um well basically all started with this video here and there's a little video here and like you say some of his comments there was uh basically he's 1900 1800 and then he sort of took it even the thing that really insulted me this is the worst thing he took the piss out of harry the h porn now, no one takes the piss out of Harry. No one. They can take the piss out of me, but they do not insult Harry. Or they will get the rough of hell upon their shoulders. 
And he did. He insulted Harry the H pawn. And, you know, for me, this was one step too far. So I responded. Maybe I was a little bit harsher in this tweet here. I was a bit annoyed. I lashed out. Um, but we now have um, a match on. And we have a grudge match on. So that's going to be happening early October. And uh, we're going to see. But I don't know. If someone attacks you for no reason, you know, get on the case. If it's someone you don't know, if it's a troll, fair enough. But should prof fellow professionals be trolling you? I don't know. I don't think so. It's a hard enough job being a professional chess player without that going on. Okay, anyway, so um, let's now have a look at some chess, shall we? Rather, I've done a little bit of a catch-up of my things. I've got some photos I'll share with you in my analysis for future videos. But for now, we'll, let's leave it at that because uh, I do want to show you this interesting game. Now, my opponent, very aggressive player. I had the black pieces in this first round. Now, what to play? I play various openings as black. Um, I don't recommend this approach. Uh, I recommend you stick to one opening and learn that well when you're starting off in chess. But as you develop, it's maybe good in GM level to play a, a variety of openings. So you can, you know, because it's a lot of preparation now at top level in chess. And if you have a number of weapons to pick from, rather than just, uh, I don't know, North Korea's nuclear weapon, let's say you've got some North Korean like ninjas as well, well then Trump would be more afraid, wouldn't he? So, you know, it's good to have a, a variety of ninjas and nukes at your thing, you know, send them in the White House, you know, as uh, nice little tea ladies, next thing they'll be, Hawa! and they take Trump down. Not that I'm saying I want that to happen, I'm just giving an example of why it'd be good to have a number of different weapons in, in your uh, arsenal. But I normally play the French defense. This is my main weapon. And I prepared quite hard in the morning, being a bit rusty. I prepared for about three hours. I, the way I prepare is, I've talked about this before in a previous video, but if you know who you're playing and they do have games on the database, I use chess base program because it has something like 15 million chess games. I search for my opponent. I find her name. I know she has lots of games. I find out what variation she plays. She seemed to play the same thing all the time. I looked on Chess Publishing, which is a very good uh, rep thing to have for the latest uh, opening advancements. I looked at their recommendations. I did my, my own research on the position I thought would arise. I used a computer in the morning. I think before the game, it's important to use a computer assessing positions which you're likely to get to have an idea of what you might want to play. Then I turned the computer off and I got my own ideas of how I'd approach the game. And it worked extremely well. Now, um, the, the game started with e4, e6, and as we say, the French defence. Now, I saw my opponent plays, I would say, the main line. Now, in my opinion, there's two ways white can try to get an advantage in the French. Knight d c3 and knight d2. Both of these moves are white's only attempt at top level at gaining an advantage. I don't believe the exchange can ever get an advantage, and I don't believe much in the advance for white either. So my opponent played knight c3, favoured by Bobby Fischer. And uh, in my, um, you know, French DVD, which I did, which is a little bit old now, uh, but it's still, I think, completely relevant, has some very exciting lines in there. I recommend the winnerware variation, bishop to b4. Now, I need to update uh, that French video. I mean, it's still, I think, great value and give you a very good understanding of the opening. But if I'm going to be honest, which I I'm always am, I've developed over the last years uh, along with, uh, you know, with my openings. And I believe now the best way to meet knight to c3 is the classical variation knight to f6. So I'm, I'm certainly planning on doing another video uh, for Ginger GM on, on this particular line because I now have quite a lot of experience in it. I've studied it quite hard and I know what I know what bloody hell I'm talking about and I, I want to share that knowledge with you. I'll share some of it here with you as well. Now, why do I think this is a better move? Well, basically, the winner wear is probably okay for black, but it's just so theory heavy. The one main line with e5, c5, and this is the so-called, I'm going to go for it quickly, so I apologise if it's a bit too quick for some of you, but a3 takes, and now the so-called so -called main line, the poison pawn variation with knight to e7, queen here, queen here, queen takes g7, is a lot of fun, but it's very theory heavy. Now, in my DVD, I give a very, I think, a good line against that, which is held up. 
but you have to remember a lot of stuff, you know. And I think you can get nice attacking position. I think the French is a great... I, they say counter-attacking. I would even say attacking opening. The way I play it, I always get some kind of crazy attack going in the French. And I actually think that knight to f6 here is, is, is now shaping up to be a great attacking way to play. Because it's a bit easier. You get different kinds of positions. But it's not as computer heavy. It's more on ideas than computer assessment. Now, what can white play? White has two lines here. Bishop to g5 pinning the knight because obviously I, I've pressurized the center here I put pressure on e4 so what does white do well white has got to either relieve the pressure with the pawn so move the pawn or try to hold the pawn there and bishop g5 is one move and uh, against this I, I'm going to recommend in a later video so I've got this uh, uh, the variation here pawn takes e4 knight takes e4 and now breaking the pin Bishop e7 because the knight on f6 can move and now the main line is bishop takes f6 and the line I'm going to recommend you play here and that I'm going to play in future. It, I mean the one thing about doing these videos I give away all my secrets so you know god forbid one of my future opponents is watching this they know exactly what I'm going to do but hey ho that that's one of the costs of sharing knowledge with everyone and here I'm going to play the very double-edged move g takes f6 and this in my eyes is a very interesting double-edged attacking position black's main idea is to go f5 and actually morozevich's idea of a6 and b5 boom boom put that in your pipe and smoke it keep coming forwards and try to gain space with a very dynamic and interesting structure we'll do some more theory on that another day but the the real i think the move you'll encounter the most here is e5 and this is a weird mix between the advanced French, because White's pushed on with e5, and the, and I would say the Tarash French, because in this position, the Black Knight really has to drop back to d7. And on d7, this knight is not particularly well placed. In the advanced French, let's just compare this so you can understand the opening more. I, I want to teach you as much as I can and try to help you understand everything about this you know the way i see it from different levels as well is this knight here picture that knight there now in the advanced french so let's just go back the advanced french is where white goes e5 now the main move kind of moves here is c5 and it's all about pressurizing this pawn here in the advanced french so you go knight here knight here and at some point the main difference is look at your knight in the classical variation the knights on d7 but in the advanced french this knight can often come either via h6 or e7 let's say knight e7 to f5 and f5 is a particularly good square in the french defense for your knight on g8 this is where this piece dreams of being if you think in life each of your pieces has a dream before the game of playing a role in the battle. If you've just seen Game of Thrones, you know, you might want to be the hero knight running at the Dragon Queen. Each piece wants to have a similar future. And the knight wants to basically in the, go to f5. This is a very nice square because you're pressurizing the main point d4. In the classical French, you get a similar kind of pawn structure, but look, the knight on d7 cannot find this f5 square it's it's a long way away from f5 so you have to come up with some other possibilities here and um there's there's plenty of ways though to keep this interesting now the main move here is f4 and everything else is fine for black white needs to gain space and the white pawns do look extremely scary on d4 e5 and f4 white is trying to hold that space advantage use that space advantage to start an attack use that space advantage to outmaneuver us on the other hand what are we trying to do well we are trying to again explode the center in the french defense you have two main breaks you have c5 and f6 sometimes g5 as well but these two pawn breaks are invaluable you, you have to play these in the french you, in, in you have to play at least one of them every time you play the french defense i find because you can't allow white center to remain 
so secure. You have to attack it. So, of course, naturally speaking, c5 is now the move to play. But now we see a slight benefit here over the advanced French from the black point of view. Now, normally when you play c5 as black, um, white would like to answer this with the move c3 because white wants to keep the pawn structure all intact. But of course, now that white has a knight on c3, this is the downside of the classical for white. White can't play c3, so we're going to get a, get this pawn off the board and already create some holes in the center of the board. For example, knight to f3, simply developing and defending that pawn. We don't need to take on d4 yet. Knight to c6, developing a piece and again attacking the weak square, developing, finding a target. Bishop to e3, these are incredibly logical moves, developing a piece and again holding this square here. And now there are numerous, numerous variations that black can try here. Uh, for example, black can try a6 and b5. Very natural idea. Black can also try queen to b6. A bit greedy, grabbing that pawn. Not really my style to grab a pawn. Black can now take on d4 straight away. What is the advantage of that move? Well, it gives black the c5 square. So something like pawn takes, knight takes, and now bishop c5 it is one possibility. We didn't have the c5 square before. But uh, the modern way of playing this and a way that I've now spent some time studying just because this tournament is the quiet developing move, bishop to e7. What is the benefit of this bishop to e7 move? Well, the way I see it is it's twofold. One, we're developing a piece and we're getting ready to castle quickly kingside, so it can't be a bad move, but mainly we're keeping the tension we're not letting our opponent know what we're doing quite yet. We're going to see what white does and then respond in kind. Now, really, I believe in these positions. The only way white can try to do something is by castling queenside. And this is another crafty idea behind this. Because if white tries something like bishop e2, we are now telegraphed. We've got more information because we can see that the bishop on e2 is not a very good square. You could say like our bishop on e7. But we are telegraphed that he's going to castle kingside. So now, in order to meet that, we can go for our secondary pawn break. Castles. Castles. And here, <coughs> I think a very interesting move is f6 at some moment. And this leads to very dynamic play. This is our second pawn break. And... Um, we're trying to just explode that center. And look how the computer's assessment has changed to thinking this is quite good for black. And this is a very good way of playing if white castles kingside. So what else can white do? Well, a more, a more difficult approach for us as black is if white tries to castle queenside. So queen d2, of course. And now another very subtle move. My next move is a very rare move. We can castle here. But I now played a6, which is a, a quite a modern idea. And the point of this a6 move is really, again, we're keeping flexible and it gives us this b5 move, which is a very useful move. And now a number of times white has played a losing, in my eyes, losing positional move here. And that is castles queenside. Now, I know I just said white wants to castle queenside, but not now, not in this position. Why? Why? Because we haven't taken on d4, and this is part of our whole game plan of playing the semi-waiting move, bishop e7. We are waiting to get more information so we can react to certain information in a certain way. And now we can play c4, which was not possible in a lot of the other lines because our pawn would have been god. But now this, in my eyes, is extremely strong. I don't care what the computer says. I'm going to disagree. I think white is nearly losing here because b5, b4, checkmate. I mean, it's horrible. The queen's coming over. c3 is going to blast the king open. I don't believe white can survive this. And and black's won uh, some numerous games in this in this in this way. So, um okay, so I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit later on. I know I'm taking a bit more time here. I've got to get back into the swing of things. But I did want to explain this opening in more depth from the way I was classical with me. And of course, the teaching opening it takes me a bit more time. 
And well, a6, what should white do now? Well, there's two moves. There's this subtle move a3 and the move played. Now a3 has the interesting idea of again, just waiting and seeing because, you know, the main move now b5 can be met by pawn takes here. I was looking at knight takes, but bishop takes is also interesting. Queen to f2. And the point of white playing a3 is that now you can't play a move like queen to b5, a5, guarding the knight on c5, the pawn's in the way. And actually, this knight on c5, it's hard to find a square for it. But okay, I had some other ideas against a3 there, which I'll share with you another time. But my opponent played pawn takes c5, and now I played knight takes c5. And the idea here, of course, my opponent, is that she can now castle queenside, because she doesn't have to worry about the idea of c4. Now, the idea I prepared here was this b5 move, and look already how much fun this position is coming. This is great fun. Opposite side castling. I'm slogging away at her king over here. She's coming at my king. But this is this is a French. Who can say the French defense is boring when they see craziness like this? And I'm ready to bring my queen out, push on with my pawn. I, my main threat here is to go b4, forcing the knight here to move. And when that knight moves, white will lose control of the c4 square. So my my knight, which has been a bad knight. Uh, in this opening, which we discussed earlier, becomes a very good knight in this good central square. Um, my mouse is also... needs a little bit of a recharge. Re re recharge. So this is my threat. And um, I, I thought white only has one good move here. It's queen f2 again. Asking my knight the question. And also uh, here opening the rook against my king. Now this is where I had this position in the morning. And this is where I did my own research. Now, on chess publishing, which is very good, chess publishing only recommended here knight to d7. I didn't want to play such a negative, passive move. And understanding the Sicilian opening, I wondered why black wasn't able to go forwards. Why go backwards in life when you can go forwards? I mean, come on. Why can't we just throw the knight into a4? And... I looked at this move and this was the one time where I turned the computer on in my preparation because I thought this was a key position in the opening and I wanted to see what the computer thought. Now to my rather dismay, the computer thought that white was, uh, or my computer is a bit of a different assessment to this, but the computer thought it was minus 0.8, which is nearly a pawn. But then I had a little look and I found one game where only one game in the, in the history of chess where this knight a4 move was played and it was a game between two english players james and dare very talented player and roberson who's an im and um i thought in that game uh basically the game that game continued knight to e2 which i don't think is a very good move and it was a fascinating game let me just show you that game that game continued queen c7 knight here knight a5 and now i think it was king to b1 knight to c4 and already i i think black is having a, a whale of a time here because look at my knights i mean my knights are hovering around his king you know they're just they're just about to swoop down like vultures and start pecking away at the flesh around that white king i'm just gonna i'm gonna rip it apart and look at computer's assessment the computer thinks that white's busted but this game continued bishop c1 and it's funny now that the computer thinks black is winning. It was an amazing game. Um, I had a, I had another move prepared here, but that game continued. Knight takes b2 with this amazing idea of a double p sacrifice. Bishop to a3 check, queen to c3 check, and now black has sacrificed two pieces. But after b4 check, king here, bishop d7 check, which is a mistake, king a5. It was actually white. According to my analysis I did in the morning, and I just run it on the computer for a little bit of time, it's actually White who was winning. I mean, what a bizarre variation. But I found an improvement on that line, and uh, I don't think we have to sacrifice on B2 straight away. But still, an amazing idea. So, going back to the point of my preparation, after Knight to A4, I saw that if my opponent now played, Ketty had played Knight to E2, that I'd be perfectly okay. I'd get this nice attacking position. So Ketty played for the first time. The first novelty on move 12 ever was knight takes a4. Now this is the position I spent, I would say, 20 minutes in the morning looking at without the computer. 
and I came to the conclusion I quite like black. And then I put it on the computer and I still thought, well, sod you computer, I still quite like black. Because in practical play, what have I got? Well, I, I, it's opposite side castling. So whoever gets the attack is the person who should win the game. Now, I've just opened up the B file for my rook. So I don't care about my double pawns. I've got an open B file. That must give me, you know, a, you know an easy attack. And then I saw a clever plan of playing an idea with bishop d7 and then something like knight to a5. And then at the right moment, this is my... You've got to think of your plan. This is what you've got to do in chess. When you play an opening, you've got to know what plans you're trying to do. How many times do I tell this? A lot of people will read a book and then they get to a position like this and the book will stop there and say slightly better for white or slightly better for black they get to the position they have no idea where they're going to put their pieces so i made sure here i knew what my plans were and i came up with a plan follow it with me i want to go bishop d7 knight to a5 queen c7 and then knight to c4 and then my knight is in a very good attacking line i have an open c file i have an open b file and i thought great this is just what i want so I thought, well, this is a fantastic position. I haven't castled quite yet another subtlety on my part. So my opponent doesn't have a target to attack. And it's not so easy for my opponent to attack my king anyway. It will take her a lot of pawns, a lot of moves to start pushing her pawns. So I, I like this position. Now my opponent played a move I had not expected. Bishop c5. Now, I think swapping off dark square bishops is quite a good idea because my bishop has potential to come into the game and attack. So this is a good idea, but I came up with a good answer here. I played a3, another thing, I can use this pawn. My opponent, Ketty, has to keep the king, her king closed, so she has to go b3. And now I came up with an aggressive move, knight to b4. Again, when you're playing chess, I think you should always start by in the positions looking at the most aggressive move look at the move that gives you the most look at moves that threaten your opponent i mean i'll be honest i'm not even sure this is the best move maybe in future i would play a5 here because i want to go a4 and just use open up open up the position with my pawns maybe something like this would be my future idea you know use my pawns to get her pawn protection you know take them apart but uh, knight b4 was so tempting, I could not resist it. And the point is, if my opponent plays something like bishop takes e7, well, I, I can flick in knight takes a2 check here. And if king b1, I have knight c3 check and I gain a winning position. I've won a pawn with the attack. Well, I've won more than a pawn. I'm probably going to take that one as well. So after knight b4, my opponent has to defend a2, so she has to go king b1. And now I had this very tricky move, queen to c7. And the point of this was, if my opponent was having a very bad day, she wanted to obviously swap dark square bishops off. But if she does go bishop takes e7, what can I do? Well, I can swing in, queen to c3, and now it's checkmate already. She can't stop queen to b2. Or if queen d4, well, she drops c2 and then drops a2. So it's going to be checkmate here. So my opponent already has the pressure against her. Now, uh, I'm going to start moving a little bit quicker now because the opening's over. My opponent came up with a good idea, bishop b6. And the point is now, if I come to c3, she gains the tempo, bishop d4. My queen has to come back. What's the point of that? No point. So I, I, re I reckon this is about still a balanced position. I play queen b7. And now bishop to d3. And it's a very interesting double-edged position here. But I want to I try to consider what pieces to swap off here. And generally, in the French defence, another thing you've got to know when you play this opening is that your light square bishop is a very bad piece. And it's a piece you want to exchange off. This is your worst piece. Why is it bags? It's trapped in behind the pawns. It's a prisoner behind this pawn, this pawn structure. Now, I think a terrible positional error here would have been something like swapping off my good knight for this bishop. I think this is a horrible positional error. Even pawn takes uh, d3, you know, is a possibility when white gets the c file. But you, my knight, my knight is a very nice piece. It's very annoying for her. I don't want to swap that off. And the thing I have to worry about is if my opponent at some point gets her knight stuck on d4. Again, you've got to think positionally what pieces you want to exchange and what pieces you want to avoid exchanging. This is key, key, key. And 
Well, I play bishop d7 with a simple idea of going bishop to b5 and swapping off that piece, developing as well. The game continued. Um, bishop c5. So now I play bishop to b5 and I swap off this piece. Now, I don't know, maybe around here I started to go wrong. My opponent was been playing very well, considering I probably shocked her in the opening. But what I thought I should have played afterwards, as the computer is now recommending, is just to take here. Well, this is one of my main ideas at the time, but I, I, I don't know why I didn't do this and go rook c8. With the idea of queen a5 winning a pawn, of simply castling, giving up this pawn, and now going rook c3, bringing my other piece in. And I thought here I should have fantastic compensation for the pawn. Maybe the computer doesn't like it, but for a human, this is very tempting to play in such a way. I think this is the way I should go. Um, back to the game, though. I play bishop b5, so I'm sticking with my principles. It's not a bad move. My opponent took on e7. And now took on b5. So now we have a more simplified position. Now she played c3, kicking my knight away. And here I had two choices, and I think I picked the wrong move. I went knight to c6 because I wanted to keep control over d4. And I wanted to be able to exchange if she moved a knight to d4. But you've got to think of the best potential for your pieces. And I should have gone knight to a6 because then again we can see this journey of my knight coming to e4 and I, you know I, this is what I should have I'm certainly should have played this and again I think the position is very unbalanced both sides king can come under attack but my idea of just bringing my knight into this square must be the correct way to play so knight to c6 was bad and Ketty played now brilliantly rather than playing passive the best way to play in chess is always play the most active moves Queen b6, the most active move, bringing the queen in, hassling my pieces over here. Now, I think I played, you know, against my principle here. I mean, maybe I should give up the pawn, but I played knight to a7. And here, I thought originally that, okay, this is okay, because if I can castle and then move my rook on h8 to b8, I will kick her pieces away, I will take over the game, because then I have b4, I have an attack. But Ketty played f5, another excellent move. And this gives ideas of f6 and taking on e6. I have to castle at some point. And now I want to again move my rook to b8. If I'm able to play this move, I'm doing very well. Um, but she played another excellent move. She just brought very logical move. Which rook is not playing? The rook on h1. She brought it into the center of the board. And now her clever idea is if I play a move like rook to b8, she's all she's stopping my ideas with this as well. She will play queen to d6. And this was not a position I wanted to play. Look how good the rook on e1 becomes. If I take the queen off, then this rook becomes a monster. And this is not a position I have any hope of winning. I'm going to struggle to draw it. So in this position, it came a critical moment of the game. And you'll get this in chess. There's another thing I want to teach you. You know, how did this game go? Well, I knew the opening because I did some my research. My opponent played very well, so I didn't really get an advantage. But she wasted a lot of time getting to this position. We've got to a critical position around here. Very dynamic, opposite side castling, lots of pieces doing lots of things. But here, I realized I'm in some danger. If she goes queen d6 and swaps queens, I'm never going to be able to win. My opponent's getting short of time. So I had, I thought this was a critical moment. I've got to now think of the best possibilities to keep the game alive and avoid doing the things she wants to do. Now, maybe the computer suggesting b4 interesting, but I came up with the, another move which I thought was very interesting rook to c8 now why well the idea of this is to play rook to c6 i've got to kick that queen away that queen is tying me down if i kick that queen away i can double rooks i might have b4 knight b5 i've got to get rid of the one main nuisance in my position and i think this is a very clever move i'd analyze the following line pawn takes e6 and now, um, rather than taking on e6, I was very tempted to play rook c6. And after pawn takes f7, I gambit a pawn. My queen can take, though. And I don't know. I mean, this is one line I thought would be very scary for my opponent in time trouble. 
when my queen now has potential to come in on the light squares, even take here. Now, I don't know if this is good or bad. The computer's saying it's bad. Very bad in actual fact. But the point is for humans, you've got to play practically in chess. My opponent's getting short of time. To calculate this position where I will bring my queen in is very unpleasant for her. And it's not so easy to see the long lines which the computer is giving here. So I think this is a very good practical move, rook c8. And that's what chess is about, playing the best move in the best situation. It's not always about playing the computer move. This move gave me better winning chances. My opponent played queen d6. And now another subtle point to this, I can play queen c7. So I, I basically, I don't want to allow my opponent's rook in the game. I can't allow that rook into the game. Now, again, the computer says that Ketty can take on e6, but... I mean, really? Can you really do this, computer? Let's have a look. I mean, I thought I could just go queen take c3 here. And I thought this looked incredibly dangerous for my opponent. And again, we're both getting a bit short of time in. The computer's just saying as calm as you like that rook e2 is fine. Which I find very hard to believe with my queen coming in. But we've got to trust the computers, I guess. I mean, I was thinking of ideas of taking and going b4 and knight b5 here. But... You know, this is where the computers do outshine us. But, you know, we've just got to keep the pressure on. But my opponent, Ketty, very short time. She went into the ending and she took on e6 now. And now I think she played the biggest mistake. I'm OK here because my rooks are looking good. But after rook d3 defending this, she allowed me to play knight to c6. And now I'm definitely better. I don't care what the computer says. I'm better. I'm stopping her knight coming into the center. Why am I better? Because my pawns are all quite good. My pawn on a3 is very annoying for her. And I have this two central pawns. My opponent has weak pawns, c3 and e5. These are weak because they can't be defended by any other pawns. I also have some nice half open line and an open line for my rooks if white ever exchanges knights i will get this type of ending which is extremely good for me because i have rook f2 and now we can see the power of the a3 pawn my rook comes into b2 for example rook c1 rook b2 and now rooks take c1 boom put that in your pipe and have a smoke um so now i'm better and Let's just see how the game went. Well, B4. Now, how do you win positions where you're a little bit better? Well, okay. The thing that I always think of in these positions is I'm always thinking of what my opponent's trying to do. In a position, now it's in the position, total, the dynamics have totally changed. Earlier on, it was very dynamic. So you had to push your own ideas. She went queen B6. You have to play risky. You have to take risks. But in positions like this, where it's not so dynamic, my opponent doesn't have any dynamic moves. I, first thing I'm thinking, what's she going to try to do? Well, knight d4 we've seen is bad. She can't do anything. So what I want to do now, and this I'm changing now to what I'm mentally thinking, I want to think of little ways to improve my position. I do not need to rush. There's no need to play any tactical ideas like d4. Let's improve my pieces, improve my pawn structure as much as I can, because I can do that, my opponent can't. How do I improve my pawn structure? Well, h6, because I want to go g5 and gain space on that area of the board. And just remember this move, because we see how important it was for me just to do these slight improvements, how it really helped me later on. Now, my opponent can't do much. Rook e2. I went rook f4. My rook is a little bit more active on f4. I'm also tempting my opponent to play g3 because if my opponent plays g3, the pawn will lose control of f3, meaning that f3 becomes a bigger weakness. So I make some weaknesses in my opponent's position. Now, the computer doesn't really understand this type of structure as well as it does earlier. Let's have a look. h3, g5, gaining space, gaining more squares on the king's side. Rook e3. And now what can I improve here? I've improved my pawns as much as I can. I can't make any more pawn moves. My rooks are quite good. I don't want to move my knight because it's controlling there. So which piece can I improve? It's getting to the ending, my king. Let's move my king in. Get ready for a later ending, king g7. g3, so I've made a little weakness there. My rook just comes back. Rook d2, king g6, just improving my pieces. Rook d1. And now what should be the next stage here? Try to think along with me. Well, 
do I want to do a breakthrough yet? Well, I didn't see a point. Why do I want to do a breakthrough quite yet? I can't see one. Can I move my pawns? Yes, h5. Gaining some space, gaining potential to play g4. Again, little by little. And my opponent now cracked. She's had enough of the pressure. She played knight d4. And now we know that taking on d4 is always the idea. And if rook takes d4, well, my opponent's in a lot of trouble there because my rook can come into the position. He, he or she who has the open lines with rooks wins the game. And after pawn takes d4, now think how you would try to convert this position or get an advantage. It might still be a draw, but I'm the one pressing. I have the two open lines. So I played rook c4. And the point of this is, I'm going to win a pawn. Rook takes a3, check. King a1, and now rook to the seventh rank. Rook to f2, activating. My opponent played rook to a8, trying to come round. And now a very clever idea. I swap off the one active piece that my opponent has, which is the rook here, by playing rook to a4. And I gain now what I'm pretty sure is a winning position. Because... My opponent has to swap rooks, otherwise a2 will drop. And this is a horrible ending for her. Why? Because look, I've made all this improvement over here. Imagine if my king was back on g8. It wouldn't be winning then. I also have a rook on the seventh rank. I also have a pawn here, which can be used to go a3 and create a, a, a net around that white king. Uh, my opponent played rook d3. And now g4 with an idea in mind. Pawn takes, pawn takes, rook here. And rook f3 is my idea. And even though it's equal material, I have this pass pawn, which is much more dangerous than my opponent's a pawn. And my king is much better placed. It's ready to come in. So it should be a winning rook and pawn ending. I'll show you the finish. Rook a8, rook d3. Why not? Why not try to win a pawn? And my opponent has to give up that pawn. And now I took the pawn. Why not? a4. King f5, just winning another pawn, and now I'm two pawns up. But my opponent played quite well here, I have to say. And there was one interesting moment later on, I'll show you. Um, my opponent caused some problems because I have to try to find a way to stop this a pawn. I mean, if I just go pawn on here, then something like here, here, rook to this square... Oh, let's get that right. Maybe not that. Sorry, um, not there first. Of course, rather than a6, white should go rook here first. And then this pawn is only a couple of squares from queening. So it's not even clear here who's better even. But I came up with a good idea. I went rook h1. And after I did a bit of maneuvering with my king, I did now rook to h2 so i have to bring my rook next to my pawn in order to stop it and there's only one more line i needed to calculate here and that was rook takes here and now my g pawn is too strong uh, my opponent lost with king c3 g2 and she resigned this was not the best defense but she's losing anyway what i had to calculate and you need to calculate even in the ending is what would happen if my opponent now played let me just get this right uh, what line was I thinking of? Is there any way to do this? Or is she already messed up? Let me just see. I thought she could make this a little bit trickier for me. So just bear with me. Try and remember my thoughts here. Maybe she can't. Maybe it's easier than I thought it was. I thought she could win this pawn somehow, which is crazy. Maybe it's before she plays a6. Oh yeah, the last thing I thought my opponent could try here. I think after a6 it's quite easily winning. But there's one technical ending that I need to know. And that was what happens if my opponent first goes rook takes e6. I thought this was a harder try. And now I thought I was winning with again playing rook h7. But now she wins this pawn by playing rook here. I think this is the best move. I play rook here. Rook takes here. Here. And now let's say rook to this square. Now how am I winning here? Well there is a win here. But actually you need to know this. I get a queen. And this is not as easy as you may think. Now, I'm going to pause the computer. I'm going to pause the computer here, even though the computer's not giving the right line already, which is amusing. Now, I know this is a technical win, but how do you win? And this is a question for you after King B3. Now, do pause the video here. Now, this is something I, I, I knew I, I calculated in advance. Black is winning, but it's not easy because if white can go king and pawn, you it will only be a draw. But this is a win. 
what is the technically right move? Now, there may only be one way to win this position. So do pause the video now to try to work out black to play and win this ending. Well, there's only one way to win. I mean, if you're trying to move the king in, you're, it's a draw. You don't move the king. If the king comes in, well, let's have a look. I think this is probably a draw. I haven't checked. But, I mean, you're making it much more difficult than you could do. I mean, because this pawn is so strong. And you get a position like this, which is a draw. So you can't do this. The simplest way to win is to, first of all, and this depends on the king's position and how far advanced your opponent's pawn is, I mean, is to cut the king off. This is the right move. If you found that move, congratulations. And this is now a very easy win because the white king can never come to any of these three squares. And what you do when the pawn pushes on, this is an important moment. Well, here... Because it's not on the 7th rank, because it's only on the 6th rank, you now play Rook chasing the pawn down. And the point of this is, the king can't support the pawn, and if the pawn goes forwards, our Rook comes behind the pawn, we win the pawn, we win the game. And this is quite a nice little winning technique, this Rook here. And what do we do after Rook at King H3? Well, now I was thinking, sorry, not pushing the pawn, if White just waits... I move my king now, and remember if the pawn comes, we can chase the pawn. If white waits, I can go here, and then at some point, I probably move my king on the other side of the rook, because, why do I move my king on the other side of the rook? Because I want to keep the rook, well, I want to keep the white king out of the game. And you can see that if white does nothing now, my king is going to come all the way around and round up that pawn. And again, when white pushes the pawn, I go rook here and I win the game. So that was just a little bit of technique there at the end. And I've seen this in some endgame manual. And you've really, I think some, one, some of the most important things to remember, guys, are get yourself a basic endgame book. I mean, I, you know, just get yourself basic endings, basic rook and pawn endings. I mean, all, all, we've done Ginger GM, Nicholas Pert has done, who's world under 18 champion, a good friend of mine, did a, the Ginger GM DVD on killer endings, part one and two. Number one's quite basic at the start, but it goes all the way through, lots of rook endings in there. I think that's a great DVD, by the way. You can buy that from Ginger GM shop for pennies, basically. Well, not quite pennies, but dollars. Um, so basically, that's my first round uh, of uh, Dundee. And that, that was an okay game, gave me some confidence for the future. And uh, like I say, interesting opening. I, I know I, I went into more detail in that game than I normally do, but I wanted to explain the, the opening in a lot more depth uh, to really try to help you out with the way I'm developing as a chess player. I used to play the winnerware French, but now I'm playing the classical French. What did I learn? Well, what I learned in my three, four hours preparation there, and I did another five hours another couple of days, so I did about 15 hours work. I try to condense there into this video so you don't have to waste your time learning what I learned. I'm trying to teach you the easy way there. And, uh, well, it's good to be back. I, I'm going to do, I think, a stream for chess.com tomorrow. Um, I'm going to try to do some more regular videos now, get back in the groove, do a bit of blitz chess, and get back rocking and rolling. Oh, I'm going to do a massive 12 hour stream at some point because I've got over 20,000 subscribers. I would like to say a big, massive thank you to everyone out there who has subscribed. Very, very kind of you. Thank you so much for uh, getting me over 20,000. It means a lot to me. And let's hope we can push on to the next step now. So um, hopefully the video wasn't too long. If it was too long, do tell me because uh, I'll make them shorter in the future. But thank you very much. Goodbye for now.